So hello everyone, uh, welcome to our uh, webinar today. Uh, let's give it a few minutes for folks to join. We'll kick it off in about two minutes. Seeing some folks uh, joining Andre, we'll give it uh, about another minute and then kick this off. Hey, Gerson, nice to nice of you to join. Hello from Canada. <laughs> Nice of you to join us from Peru. We have an international audience. We have an international audience, absolutely. Oh, Amanda, you know you're cheating. <laughs> we know you, Amanda. All right, folks, uh, folks are trickling into today's webinar. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, again, depending where you are. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Veliquet. I'm the CEO of the Blockchain Supply Chain Association. Um, our association is about pretty self-explanatory blockchain for supply chain. Uh, we hear a lot about, uh, about supply chain. Uh, we hear a lot about blockchain. And uh, our association is here to do th well, uh, three things, actually. Uh, one is to do some advocacy work for our industry. So talking with governments and, and, and hearing government's priorities and bringing back to our, our members. We also actively work on standards and, and policy. Uh, we are members of a few different uh, standards setting initiatives globally. Uh, second thing that we do, of course, is collaboration. It's all about collaboration, especially in the blockchain world. And uh, by collaborating, we mean you know, uh, setting up uh, partners uh, together and uh, working on specific projects, uh, establishing some white papers, etc. And uh, third, uh, last but not least thing that we do is education. And that's all about, uh, uh, you know, bringing information to, to folks like yourself that are hungry to understand what blockchain is and its impact on the supply chain. So we bring the blockchain experts to the supply chain experts and vice versa. And uh, one of the things that we do is uh, the, uh, like, like the event that we're holding today, our special guest today is Andre De Castro from Blockchain of Things, who's going to, uh, funnily enough, and, and I, I did a few posts on, on LinkedIn about this, Typically in the blockchain for supply chain world, we always say blockchain is not Bitcoin, right? Uh, blockchain is not about cryptocurrency. And, and the big joke in our industry, at least in our, in our world, is that, you know, blockchain isn't Bitcoin. Bitcoin is blockchain. And yet today we have somebody going to talk to us about Bitcoin in the supply chain. So Andre, uh, nice, nice to have you on board. Um, tell us about yourself and uh, tell us about the wonders of Bitcoin as it relates to setting up a, a supply chain. So welcome and uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Eric, for having me. And I want to thank um, all the attendees for joining. My name, once again, is Andre DeCastro. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Blockchain of Things. Uh, the interesting part about Blockchain of Things is that we've built an enterprise solution called Katanis, and that's the name of the product. And what I'm going to do today is talk about some trends in the industry, um, what the differences are between uh, DLTs, private blockchains, and public blockchains, 
and how it's possible to use public blockchains in the supply chain space and why you might consider doing so. So to do that, I'm gonna kick off a uh, PowerPoint slide here um, and we'll get into this. Uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes before the end of this call, we'll open this up to a QA session uh, for everybody. So um, I'm just trying to see here why, oh. We'll kick this off as a QA session. So take notes. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions um, dur during this whole session, okay? Um, and it will be rather interesting. So implementing the supply chain using Bitcoin blockchain technology, or more importantly, understanding the differences between um, uh, distributed ledgers, private blockchains and distributed ledgers versus public blockchains, which are have always been seen as value transfer and used for finance. So today, the, the state of industries when it comes to supply chain and even outside the supply chain, when large companies are considering using blockchain technology, they look towards two things. They look towards distributed ledgers and private blockchain implementations, right? And the reasons for those are sort of obvious, right? So when you get a private blockchain, you get high privacy and control, but on the opposite side, you get low transparency and low global footprint. Because typically you would get a distributed ledger or a private blockchain, you would install it in one location, then you would install it in another location, then you'd connect up those so they could speak to each other, maybe you would get a consortium. So the footprint is rather small. And then from a transparency perspective, although you can show things to the world, doing so opens up your intranet and, and, and creates all sorts of challenges. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have uh, public blockchains that are perceived for value transfer and uh, financial implementations. And then we have the opposite of that. They have very high transparency, a tremendous global footprint, but very low privacy and very low control. And when we talk about privacy and control in the um, aspect of large companies and supply chain, then you have many, many challenges because you need the privacy and the control. But what we're seeing and what the industry is noticing as they are implementing distributed ledgers and private blockchains is that it would be nice to have the best of both worlds. So we understand that all clients need ha have different needs. Some use cases from some of the clients require anonymity and privacy, yet others require transparency. I would even go further and say that a lot of the implementations require use cases, require both privacy, anonymity, and transparency at the same time. So flexibility in the overall implementation is key, right? Requiring permissioning and flexibility would be probably the best of both worlds on these implementations. Because when you do have that, then you have the ability to get more individuals to onboard onto your solutions. And what we're seeing is exactly that. What we're seeing are companies coming and saying, well, we've implemented a POC. Sometimes 
They talk about the LTs from not being too different than what they could do with their internal databases. Other times, um, they, they tell us that they are disappointed because they thought that blockchains would bring a different aspect to things, right? And then other times they discuss the challenges in adoption because the, the implementation is perceived to, see, to be proprietary. The, the challenge is getting the best of breed where it isn't perceived to be proprietary, where it allows most flexibility and it addresses this in a cost-effective manner. So if we look to public blockchains, public blockchains have a lot of challenges, right? Because it would be great if we could bring all of the facilities of DLTs and private blockchains to the public blockchain scenario. So let's, so let's talk about the challenges with public blockchains, right? So most people are surprised to hear that public blockchains don't even obfuscate any information. No information on a pub public blockchain is encrypted. So that's a huge challenge for supply chains and corporations who want to keep their intellectual property or what they're doing um, from prying eyes. Uh, although these public blockchains use cryptography, encryption is just one segment of an umbrella of uh, cryptographic technologies. They have limited messaging capabilities, meaning that they can't handle a lot of information. Give, to give you a for instance, the Bitcoin blockchain can only hold 80 bytes of information. That's 80 characters or less than half of a tweet. There is no security on public addresses. Now, it would be silly if, um, if I used uh, the Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchain and you saw that my application had a public address and you sent me some Bitcoins or you sent me some Ethereum because that's irreversible and I would gain from that, right? But there's no security and security is key in any enterprise deployment. Handling of cryptocurrencies, because these cryptocurrencies, the native coin to the blockchain is intrinsically tied to the blockchain, creates a huge limitation, right? And these are all limitations that, if we look to address, would change the space. It's difficult to integrate with because there aren't tools out there made for non-financial applications to use. The, these public blockchains. It requires protecting keys and doing key management, which in itself is very burdensome. So now we can start looking and understanding why supply chains gravitate towards private blockchains and DLTs. Um, it's said that transaction messages are slow in blockchains such as uh, Bitcoin. But we, we're soon going to see that a lot of these challenges can be quickly overcome. There's no native support for the idea of tokens, right? We hear a lot today of NFTs and its applications, both um, in supply chain implementations and outside of the supply chain itself, but they don't intrinsically have a token protocol uh, with them. And there's limited knowledge of the underlying blockchain or the protocol itself, right? So it becomes sort of a black box. And it's the reason why companies initially gravitated towards private and uh, distributed ledgers. However, if we could look at this from a different perspective and say, could we add a second layer of fabric so companies can deliver these transformational solutions and get all of the advantages of public blockchains and all of the advantages of distributed ledgers and private blockchains, we would have a true win. And, and today, I'm here to present to you uh, Katenis. And Katenis is exactly that. Katenis is a second layer technology 
that was built from the ground up to bring all of the value that DLTs and private blockchains have together with all of the values that public blockchains can produce for companies. And we're going to talk about what these are. So Catenis in itself is a uh, visible API web services layer, okay, that creates a controlled secure loop on top of an open, transparent global ledger. So in essence, Catenis's platform uses the global Bitcoin blockchain to bring the benefits of both of the worlds together. So when implementing blockchain technologies in internal or external to, to your company in supply chain implementations, there's a win on both sides. So the solution itself brings to the open Bitcoin blockchain features to transform and improve business processes. And here, there are three main categories that Catenis addresses. On the security side, which I would probably deem to be one of the most important is encryption and permissioning. So all of a sudden, companies can use the most secure blockchain with the largest footprint in the world, right? And secure their applications and encrypt all communications in a way that makes them feel comfortable that they have complete and total control of what they need. Additionally, on the security side, it provides inscription onto the global Bitcoin blockchain for auditing purposes, which is really good um, in any regulatory space. And when you're dealing with goods in the supply chain that require a lot of regulatory visibility, right? Allowing the regulators to understand that none of the information that occurred can be modified because it isn't centrally controlled as DLTs can be or private blockchains can be. On the, on the security side, it addresses um, all the public private key infrastructure and um, provides perfect forward secrecy encryption which is in equivalent to military-grade encryption. On the enhancements, it brings the ability to handle large payloads of data, whether that's a bill of lading, whether that's um, uh, packages of documents and content. Any data can now be sent across the peer-to-peer -peer network at a global scale. There's no more limitations of below 80 bytes. Immutable tracking on enhancements, the ability to create these atomic units that are um, referred to as tokens in functionality and attach them to payloads, attach them to information in general, peer-to-peer -peer messaging, and it could also address um, an issue known as the IoT kill switch problem. On the other end of the spectrum, um, blockchain things with the Catenis platform has also built ease of use features such as web services API. So if you want to integrate with any language in the world, you don't need to train or bring on or employ new engineers. You could write in whatever language your base systems are written in. One click creation of endpoints, all of the cryptocurrency 
throughout the whole platform is abstracted, meaning that customers who use the Catenis platform never have to hold secure or purchase any Bitcoins, yet they get to use and interact with the Bitcoin blockchain at a global scale. It automatically provides all key management and no cryptographic knowledge is needed. And that provides an encompassing solution to what's important for companies dealing with and building supply chains when they need to take advantage of blockchain technology. So let's do a quick comparison between what Catenis does with Bitcoin versus a private blockchain or a DLT on the other side, right? So we can start talking about what tends to be important from a supply chain perspective, and that is a global footprint. So when you use Catenis with Bitcoin, you're getting the advantage of thousands of computers and thousands of nodes across the world as close as possible to your warehouses, your partners, uh, even your consumers, whereas private blockchains have limited footprint. Both Catenis using Bitcoin and DLTs do not require the use of the native cryptocurrency. So those two things are on par. Where this starts becoming really significant is on backend maintenance costs. Because blockchain of things doesn't have a blockchain and we use the Bitcoin blockchain, there is no ongoing maintenance costs for maintaining and propping up a blockchain and ensuring that that blockchain um, is running correctly. So as opposed to DLTs, where there are significant maintenance costs, where you need uh, full-time employees to ensure that these systems are up. It's because we created a web services layer, it's development language agnostic, meaning that you could use and leverage the existing technical staff you have today, if you happen to have a technical staff, in the language, writing in whatever language you're most comfortable with. Whereas DLTs and private blockchains have proprietary and limited development language. It's easily accessible. If you want to make your information easily accessible to anyone throughout the world, because you have the ability to permission and encrypt, but at the same time, you have the ability to, to make certain parts of the data transparent and anyone in the world can access that data you've made transparent. There's no question that the blockchain itself, when it comes to Bitcoin, it secures over a trillion dollars of people's money is the most proven and hardened blockchain in the world, whereas DLTs and private blockchains have unvetted code with their code base. Um, of course, by using the global Bitcoin blockchain, you get trust and independent verification. Whereas in many DLT implementation, there isn't the same level of trust and definitely not the ability to do independent verification of the information. We've brought to the Bitcoin blockchain real-time fast messaging of data so we can log data, we can transmit data, everything in real time, still using the blockchain as the control plane. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The support for, for uh, assets and tokens on the Catena side is extremely robust. Not only can you create fungible and non-fungible tokens, but even the data that's associated with non-fungible tokens are encrypted. 
and can, can be protected by the company itself. And whereas, and you're not limited to a walled garden scenario like you would be in DLTs and private blockchains. And incorporated with Catenus, we've also added the interoperability with po uh, popular blockchains via our tokening protocol. Here is a simple diagram of how the second layer technology works. Um, at the bottom, we use the Bitcoin blockchain as the control plane, which is decentralized, verifiable, transparent, and has a global footprint. But public blockchains, as I mentioned before, aren't great at holding data. Well, but that's true for even private blockchains and DLTs. So the data gets stored in the decentralized file store. In our case, we've built this component as a plugin which allows us to place the data in whatever proprietary repository the company has and likes to use. And above the blockchain and the decentralized store, we have Catenus. And Catenus provides, once again, tokens, messaging, logging, encryption, permissioning, and notification services. All of that gets exposed through a standard uh, web services API layer, which makes it super simple for companies to build applications and integrate existing systems and devices across the global supply chain. So today's architecture looks like this. We have cloud computing, we have facilities that access that cloud computing, creating two central points of failure. Not only do you have to ensure that your systems are up and working relevantly, but you are not even in control whether or not AWS or Azure goes down. And AWS and such systems tend to go down about three to four times a year. And in different, if you count all the different regions, even more. So we get this architecture and implementing the, uh, using the global Bitcoin blockchain, we change the paradigm. Now the global Bitcoin blockchain is completely redundant. It's lines of communication from peer to peer and packages that are being sent across the globe are completely redundant. The, the blockchains themselves are completely redundant and you need not manage those blockchains at all. So this completely turns the face of the network architecture that's being used to a more robust and resilient architecture at no cost to the company that's building the blockchain supply chain solution. So from a core savings perspective, uh, Bitcoin's extensive network of computers creates a global fault tolerant mesh. Its peer to peer communication channels are extremely robust and fully redundant. You need no full-time employees to maintain the blockchain or ensure that the communication lines across your DLTs or private blockchains are always up because these are always guaranteed to be up because of the massive scale that a Bitcoin has already achieved, which equals significant cost reductions on annual maintenance. In addition, Catenus is a second layer technology. So we provide off-chain technology, reducing messaging costs to cents. So transaction costs, when you log something to the blockchain, no longer costs a few dollars in the public blockchain. Depending on how many messages you use, we can bring that down to pennies, sometimes quarters of a, of a penny, depending how large the supply chain implementation is. 
and all reading of information is always free. So imagine you could log a driver's license to the blockchain. Well, that cost might cost you a couple of cents, but reading that information is free forever for the company. So there is no comparison from a cost perspective. So Catenis brings robust features and cost savings uh, to companies. In general, use cases for supply chain using Catenis breaks down into three major categories. And I wanna talk about these. And this isn't a limitation of the platform. The platform is extremely powerful. Um, however, these are the important sections for supply chain. Recording of immutable data for supply chain management and proof of origin provenance is key. And when we talk about recording of information, we're talking about any type of information, any size of information, all of it in real time, okay, uh, by leveraging Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer communication channels. Second in this category is messaging. We talk about secure device and system messaging from a communication perspective or IoT perspective. Now, when we talk about messaging and sending data payloads, no matter how large across a peer-to-peer -peer network, we're really bringing something that has never existed before because we're using the Bitcoin blockchain as a time chain with tamper-evident audit trails. So when you send a message from one system to another system, not only is it secure and encrypted, but when the message is sent, it's logged and audited to the global Bitcoin blockchain. And when it's read, it's logged and audited. So now we have an end-to-end -end tamper evident audit trail of occurrences, okay, at extremely competitive pricing. And then on the digital asset and tokenization control, we talk about tokens. Now tokens can be value tokens, so you can create incentive programs around your blockchain, right? But they can also be uh, atomic units, NFTs, they're, they're referred to, that now can be attached to all sorts of documentation and, and flows and even to control hardware itself. We call this hardware as a service. Um, and I have an example of how this works. So to understand the overall system, I've created a quick interactive diagram of the few things you could quickly do with Catenis at a global footprint. And it's important to note that all of this and all of the communication is not only flowing at a global footprint, but it's using the most redundant, the most secure blockchain communication lines on the planet. So of course we could send simple messages from one system to the other um, and have smart contracts and programs execute at the edge network at the speed of the processor. But those messages can be sent back and forth allowing um, heterogeneous systems to, to communicate, right? And execute and have total control and auditing trail for companies. But we could start combining um, this unique communication across a global footprint. So when a message gets sent out, it could be sent out to every office and location that's important to that supply chain, be it a partner, uh, even a customer that's ready to receive goods on the fact that goods have been shipped and are on their way. We can start combining message requests with delivery of large payloads. And when those, that delivery occurs, it can occur to multiple locations across the supply chain and even the planet, giving you 
percent audit trail of what occurred based on date and time, completely auditable by your company, and with the ability to choose when you expose data and when you don't expose data. So now we can imagine if we encircle here um, Japan and we have these continuous endpoints on a delivery ship, as it arrives, it can communicate to its downstream partners and at the same time produce a bill of lading or an invoice and send it, right? So we can start intermixing this power of sending data payloads with messages, right? And then we can even start getting more powerful and understanding that we can create tokens and these tokens live in the form of cryptographic keys. And we can start interacting with outside of software. We can start interacting with hardware because uh, a, a key can enable a robotic device or arm instantly across the planet um, in the manufacturing facility. Or we can now bring the concept of hardware as a service to light for corporations. So we can imagine now if we have um, uh, industrial devices that are connected to our supply chain, right? And we are le uh, leasing some of these devices to some countries like in South America or Africa, where you might do hardware as a service contractually based where they have to pay uh, a, a monthly fee for using that piece of hardware. A lot of times companies lose out because that piece of hardware continues to be used in the medical uh, field, for instance. Yet there's no legal recourse in a lot of these countries to collect on the contract that you've signed with that company. So now we can start producing tokens, these atomic units, and build programs within the microprocessors that say that this device only functions and can only function when it receives a token and functions for a limited scale of time a week, 30 days, six months, depending on the leasing terms. And you could send that and ensure that, the, that it, the equipment, the metered equipment only works for that amount of time. And the reasons why we could do this is that end to end, everything is encrypted. End to end, everything is permissioned. So my device in Australia, my endpoint in Australia, be it a laptop or a computer, can only communicate with, with the endpoint of my supply chain systems in Africa, allowing you complete and total control of all of the information across the supply chain and disseminating the information at a global scale, significantly reducing costs. We believe at Blockchain of Things that we're redefining the space. We're bringing to companies what, what companies initially envisioned when it comes to the power of blockchain technology for supply chain at a global footprint, giving them the flexibility they need and the complete control, encryption and obfuscation when they need it. Um, now I'm, we're, um, we wanted to create a uh, 15 to 20 minute uh, time span for any questions. But before we dive into that, I want to tell everyone that Blockchain of Things is available. You can do a screenshot. Um, um, also, our friends at the Blockchain Supply Chain Association of Canada will send over a copy of all of the slides of this presentation. If you would like an in-depth demo of the product itself, it's really easy. All you have to do is go to blockchainofthings.com. We have a contact us form, fill out the form, 
Let us know that, that you saw us during this presentation. Let us know what you'd like to see more, and we'll provide an in-depth look at the product itself, answer any technical questions you want, and work with you if you want. We even have a quick start program to launch for uh, uh, proof of concepts. So we're always available, and these are all of our channels. Um, so contact us for any personalized demos. Uh, Eric, I will give it back to you and allow you to lead the following conversation. Well, thank you very much, sir. That was an awesome presentation. I mean, I'm excited with the hardware as a service uh, concept. Uh, I mean, I, we're seeing hyper-connected devices popping up all over the place. I think supply chain is right for this kind of thing. Uh, I, I'm really excited and, and I love the concepts uh, that, that you've put together. So fantastic job. Uh, just to, to, to reiterate, yes, we will be sending out all the slides. Uh, the uh, recording uh, will be put on YouTube and we'll share the link to our YouTube channel for this as well. Um, I do have one question from Linda. Hey, Linda, how are you? Long time to speak. Um, are there any use cases currently in action? So are you, are you live with the solutions? Yes, we are live with the solutions. Um, we actually um, built a supply chain implementation originally a, uh, a few years back for ISMS. And I'd like, I, I can talk about that fairly quickly is for the industrial military uh, uh, um, complex. Uh, they have a CRM type system where they sell this to the Lockheed Martins of the world. When uh, Lockheed Martin gets a contract, they have a bunch of subcontractors. These subcontractors are supposed to log ISO documentation. Uh, they came to us because they wanted to get these document packages and log proofs on the Bitcoin blockchain. So when regulators come and because regulators will come after to see if these subcontractors, and it could be tens of thousands of subcontractors on like a jet, they'll come and they, um, the subcontractors will start creating the documentation in the back room. And they wanna make sure that the documents haven't been modified. So we also built a little program where could, they could drag and drop. And that information is sent to, um, uh, is compared to what was entered on the blockchain during, during the supply chain. A lot of companies, I will admit, this is all brand new technology on the DLT side and on the uh, private blockchain side, including with Katenis. But Katenis has been around, guys. Blockchain of Things Incorporated in 2015. We've been around for seven years. Okay, you may not have heard of us. We are a small company, but most of the customers we have are in POC stages. And that's the reality of the industry today. Okay, the reality of the industry is that um, most all implementations are on um, uh, POC stages. Absolutely true. Uh, any other questions? So folks, uh, if you have questions, uh, you can either use the Q&A if you're shy. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, we can, uh, we can uh, unmute you and, uh, and have you ask the question live. Uh, put it in the chat if you want. I'm excited. I, I've taken a, a whole bunch of notes. Andre will be speaking about uh, a few of uh, the projects that we're working on together for sure. Uh, do we have any questions, folks? Think you've blown everybody away. <laughs> no, uh, some people are shy. Oh, another great any, question from any, Linda. E, e, uh, what's the question there? So any ESG pushback because of the proof of work, right? Uh, public blockchains, a lot of gas money, a lot of electricity, a lot of uh, environmental yeah. so, concerns. So, so, so I, I think we're going to be flushing that out. The industry itself, and this is coming from the mining sector, is uh, starting to, to show the world its transparency. Uh, the industry, the mining industry, I, there's a lot of hoopla on the use 
of energy when it comes to the Bitcoin blockchain. And why do I say that? Because um, for, for a long time, the big, um, who controlled mining in the Bitcoin world was China. And we heard a lot of news, oh, China is going to stop mining and Bitcoin is going to collapse. Well, China outlawed mining last year. Bitcoin didn't collapse. It only grew stronger. But during the life, right, for the last decade of Bitcoin, all miners had to compete with the Chinese, which were using the hydroelectric plants of these huge cities that were uninhabited. So they were using this free excess electricity they were getting for free. So the Western miners, miners in the US, in Europe, in Latin America, had no choice but to seek the most environmentally friendly and cheapest alternative to energy. So all of the things that you're hearing on the news, it is a lot of hoopla, okay? Because governments fear the power of what Bitcoin is doing. And case in point, it's not only encroaching in finance, but now it's encroaching in, in the large industrial sectors on non-financial applications. So all of these miners in reality have very low carbon emissions, very low non-renewable energy sources, because if they didn't, they just couldn't compete. So what the industry has done, and this has been a, via a push from Elon Musk, is it's starting to now gather to be transparent, to show the world that, yes, it spends energy, but it's spending the energy from renewables that doesn't affect the planet. So there's a lot of hoopla, sort of like the hoopla that used to exist that, you know, they ban mining, Bitcoin's going to collapse. We already know that that's not true. Then they would say you could never use Bitcoin because you can't buy a cup of coffee with it because the fees are too expensive. Yet today we have the country, we have a whole third world nation in South America using Bitcoin to buy dollar beers and, and 25 cent pieces of candy, right? So that was all news hoopla also. So I don't, I don't want to be the one to say this, but we have to take all of the news and information that we hear with a grain of salt these days. And there's a lot of people who love to hate the fact that there is, you know, a decentralized competing technology in the world today that is disrupting industries, right? Incumbents don't like this. A lot of incumbents own and wealthy people own news medias also. So we have to really, really be careful. Uh, from a pushback perspective, it's easy to get real reports. And there are reports and studies now that aren't in the news that show that the although the energy usage is high, it all comes from sustainable renewable energy sources, and it helps for the renewable energy footprint in the world. I think Linda would certainly agree with you that decentralized is the way to go. She's also asking if there are any artificial intelligence components in your encryption layer. Yes, yeah, so we have, we have intelligent components within the platform itself. It isn't a, uh, a UI, uh, an artificial intelligence suite, but that's not our focus, right? So the focus of Catenis is to allow uh, a company's supply chain systems to take advantage of the global Bitcoin blockchain. And because it's a web services API layer, you may choose to use one or two or three of the functionality of the robust platform. You don't need to use the whole platform, right? You could decide, well, I only want the messaging component or I only want the messaging component with, with red receipts when the data is delivered, right? Or I only want uh, to, to tie into the APIs to log information. So even if you look at a very, very robust um, application that uses the blockchain, the application has authentication and, and a lot of things that it brings to the table, but the, 
percentage of the robust application that actually uses the blockchain tends to be 10 to 15 percent right so it's no different than if you wanted to integrate sms messaging into your application think uber right Uber wants to integrate SMS messaging, so they may go to Twilio, which it provides a web service for SMS messaging. What does that really represent of the Uber application? 2%, 3%? And that's where we tie in, right? You may have a robust supply chain management system. And now you want to say, okay, well, this date I want to log and that date I want to track. So you, what's that going to represent of your platform? It only may re only represent five or 10%, maybe less of your platform altogether. We're here to empower that five or 10% to lower your costs and increase your global footprint um, uh, to apply this. So when you think about that, you understand that you can now get your application and interface it with the blockchain and with AI systems. So you can get information that's been logged to the blockchain, pull it out through web services and pump it into AI systems, get information from AI systems and pump it back into the blockchain. I have a great example of this, a fantastic example we have, which I would love to show to all of the members on um on this um, webcast, we have a drag and drop platform to build blockchain solutions and applications. It's really nifty to use, but one important aspect is that in a classroom scenario, I wanted to show the power of the platform. So I decided to build an application that directly interfaced with IBM Watson to use its AI engine. So during a classroom scenario in about six hours, I was able to build with, this, with the drag and drop platform, the ability to launch a drone. This drone would look at an individual, take pictures of that individual's hands. If the pictures of that individual's hands would now be pumped into via the web services interface of IBM Watson, if Watson, returned and said that it believed above a 78% threshold that the person was holding either a knife or a gun, the drone would circle the individual, taking pictures of the individual's face and logging it to the Bitcoin blockchain. And we were able to build this in six hours without writing any code. And that's the true power of are smart contracts. They run in real time, coded in any language, and you can interface in and out of the blockchain and in and out of any secondary or tertiary system at the power of the microprocessor of the edge network. So thank you very much for that question. Are, are you talking about Node Red when you're talking about this drag and drop? Because I've seen what you've done with Node Red. I, you know, I'm a, a home automation uh, geek sometimes, uh, not, not the best one, but I still like to do it. And we use Node Red, right, for, for, for scenes and, and automating stuff in our house. And uh, seeing you use Node Red uh, is what, what, uh, what got me excited the first time. Yes, absolutely. And, and we tend to do that with best of breed technologies, right? So instead of building from scratch a drag and drop interface, we leverage Node Red. And what we've done is we've gotten a robust set of services, right? Typically called API methods, a robust set of services. And we completely integrated that into the Node Red platform. And any company worth its salt has integration into Node Red. And Node Red is a really powerful WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get, drag and drop environment and tool used. Uh, throughout industries to interconnect into databases, email systems, um, CRM systems such as Salesforce. So all of these companies have integrated and exposed the power of their functionality through Node-RED. And we have also our components in Node-RED, we call Catenis Flow, right? Using Catenis on the Node-RED platform through a flow diagram is, is part of our product 
that allows you now to interface with AI systems and with databases and all sorts of other robust systems. It's all through Node-RED. And that's very important to understand that from a good engineering perspective is the focus of the company, not to reinvent and rebuild the wheel, but to use the best wheels, the most popular um, wheels that exist throughout industry. And it's the reason why we don't have a blockchain and we're a pure play on top of the Bitcoin blockchain because we believe that it's the most powerful, the most redundant, right? Um, and vetted code base when it comes to blockchains in the world. So why not use best of breed? Absolutely. Um, another question from Linda. Bridges have been points of vulnerability in blockchain layer two and three solutions. Uh, are there losses of security at these integration points? Great question. Linda knows her stuff. Uh, are there losses of security? So, so the general question is, is there a loss of security when, when you're interfacing via Katanas, right? That's, is that the question? Yeah. In a nutshell. So, so, so typically when you're interacting between two systems, right, that there's always some levels of, of, uh, of vulnerability. Right. So, so one needs to understand that we're, we're really in general, a pass through technology, right? So if you were to create a transaction in Bitcoin and send that transaction in Bitcoin, typically that's a value-based transaction meaning that the Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself is being transmitted. So you're transmitting a store of value. When it comes to us and our customers, there's no value being transmitted aside from data. Now, data is very valuable to companies, I understand. But we're talking about um, uh, the, the communication lines of transmission, right? That's being used to transmit tens of millions sometimes billions of dollars worth of value across those communication lines. And those are the exact communication lines we're using because all we do is piggyback on them, right? So uh, we believe that our second layer brings enhanced security, right? Now, when we're talking about Node-RED interfacing into AI systems and different systems, of course, if you're integrating into a system where security is not their number one uh, uh, prerogative, right? You need to look at every system you integrate with, right? We come at this and we, our layer just adds encryption to an already hyper secure system. Right. So what we're doing is layering more security on top of security. Right. And that's that's the general approach when it comes to our product with Katanas. I can't speak to interfacing with other secondary and tertiary systems. So we're coming up on the top of the hour, folks. I appreciate everybody. Um, as Andre mentioned earlier, he would be thrilled to do uh, personal demos for you. So on, on the slides that we'll send out, I will certainly send uh, his contact information or reach out to us at the BSCA. Uh, I, I've seen what he does with Node Red. I think you will be impressed as well. I would like to thank you very much, Andre, for, uh, for uh, uh, partaking uh, in your, uh, your knowledge today and uh, uh, again, I have a few notes. I'll reach out to you on a few different projects we we're working on. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, folks, for, for dropping in. I hope you like it and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for, for having me. And uh, I want to thank all the per participants um, uh, for joining us. All right, folks. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.